Hi. The power of association. Choosing wisely for a blessed journey. In this study, we explore the power of association, its blessings and pitfalls, and how they shape our faith and lives. Through inspiring biblical stories and practical insights, we'll learn how to choose and sustain godly relationships that uplift our faith and enrich our communities. Don't miss this opportunity to reflect on your associations and their impact on your spiritual journey. The power of association, choosing wisely for a blessed journey. Want to know more? Hang around. Welcome, welcome to Lions Raw 38 Ministries. Amos 38 tells us, a lion or the lion has roared, who will not hear or fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? My name is Fernando George Magalhães, and we are an apostolic ministry with a prophetic teaching edge. It is our passion, our mission to reignite, equip, and release Christ-like disciples both locally and globally. We do that for our itinerant ministry, but as well as providing you with resources just like this one to help you, to aid you in your God-given calling. Today, we got a great topic, the power of association. The power of association bringing us to our main verse today. And our main verse comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 20. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, and we're reading from the Amplified Classic, as you can see on the screen. He who walks as a companion with wise men is wise, but he who associates with self-confident fools is a fool himself and shall smart for it. Wow. Wow. And I don't mean just the word we read. I mean, wow, look at this babe next to me. <laughs> I keep having a bug going around. <laughs> hello, hello. We got Prophet Sabrina here today with us again. We, mm. She should be our VIP. No, she's anymore. our VIP. No. Oh. <laughs> Anyways, we, we got a great topic. She's got a, a fantastic study for us today. And without further ado, I want her to take over. But before she does, actually, let me just give you a quick introduction, as usual. Just for those that may arrive a little bit later, today's word, as you heard at the beginning, will be a study on navigating the path. No, that's last week's, George. Mm -hmm. That's right. It will be <laughs> the power of association, choosing wisely for a blessed journey. The power of association, choosing wisely for a blessed journey. Let me see here. That's right. So. Through inspiring biblical stories and practical insights, we'll learn how to choose and sustain godly relationships that uplift our faith and enrich our communities. So in our study today, more specifically, we'll be covering the following relevant topics. Number one, the importance of our association, blessing by virtue, blessings by association. Number two, blessings by association. A, the story of Ruth and Naomi. B, the story of Paul and the jailer. Number three. Deception by association. A, the story of Achan. B, the story of Elimas the sorcerer. Number four, how to sustain godly association. A, connect with those who journey with God. B, evaluate character. C, reflect on scripture, and D, prioritize godly relationships. All right, that's what we're going to be covering today. Let's pray, and you can get on to it. All right, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord God, as we are about to hear the word, Lord. We thank you that the word that comes out of our mouths of your word, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, and those who are hearing it, it will fall on, on good ground, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, that the breakthrough come as whoever is listening, Lord God, will listen with the word of testimony being said, Lord God, and that they may receive breakthrough, Lord God, as your word is being, Father God, hallelujah, being now. Uh, preached out, Lord God, we declare breakthrough, we declare, Father God, chain of restraint to be broken, Lord God, and we declare, Father God, revelation that will turn into manifestation. Thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
So as George already introduced today, we are going to study how we associate with the community and its impact on us. We will concentrate on the blessing and potential pitfalls of association while providing practical ways to choose and interact wisely in our daily walk for a blessed journey. Number one, the importance of our association. I truly believe that all blessing comes from God. While we can experience blessings through our own virtue, today I want to highlight that amazing blessings that arise from our relationship with others. Yes, we can be blessed because of others too. Before we dive into that, let's explore the difference between being blessed through our personal qualities and being blessed by connection with those around us. Number, uh, no, I want to say number, say A, blessing by virtue. Blessing by virtue is a wonderful gift that comes from the goodness of our character. You know, you do a good thing and you reap. What you sow is what you reap. And the choices we make that reflects God's will. It is linked to divine purpose. So it's not on our own, right? A virtue is wonderful, but it's not wonderful by ourselves. It's wonderful through Christ Jesus. So it is linked with divine purpose and centers on the work of Jesus Christ, indicating that genuine blessings arise from living in accordance with God's righteousness and truth. Right, let's confirm that with a verse. James 4 verse 10. So James 4 verse 10 in the Amplified Classic. Humble yourselves, feeling very insignificant in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you, He will lift you up, and make your lives significant. Wow. So we, this illustrates that blessings of virtue, even though we said blessing of virtue, it's really centered on Jesus Christ, from Jesus Christ, right? B, blessing by association, which is what we're going to be concentrating on today. Now, this highlights the wonderful blessings that flows from our connection and relationships with others who are also favored. Now, why do I say also favored, right? There's a reason, because I'm talking about children of God when it comes to that, right? We will get into it more. It's a reminder of how sharing our lives with others who uplift us can enrich our own experiences and even bring more joy into our lives, right? Let's, let's uh, confirm that with a verse, right? Proverbs 13 verse 20, Proverbs 13 verse 20, reading from the Amplified Classic. He who walks as a companion with wise men is wise. But he who associates with self-confident fools is a fool himself and shall smart for it. Mm. So in summary, blessings by association emphasizes relational connection to God's favor. While blessing by virtue focuses on moral integrity and alignment with divine purpose. So let's, let's look more into it, right? Number two blessings by association now we're going to get into it so in this section we are you know i'm excited right to share two inspiring examples of how blessing can come through association drawing both from both the old and the new testament so that you know we you can see it both in both sides now these st stories highlight the incredible ways in which our connections can lead to divine favor and even transformation now, the first story we're going to look at will be that of Ruth and Naomi. We all know that story, but I will just give a little bit of a context about it, right? So the story of Ruth and Naomi, Naomi is set against the backdrop of a time of famine in Israel. Naomi, a widow from Bethlehem, had moved to Moab with her husband and two sons. After the, um, after the death of her husband and sons, Naomi decides to return to her homeland, which is Bethlehem, urging her daughters-in-law, because there was two, Ruth and Opa, um, Orpa, to stay in Moab and remarry. Ruth, however, demonstrates profound loyalty and commitment to Naomi, 
she chooses to accompany her. Let's confirm it with a verse, right? All right. Ruth 1 verse 16. Again, in the Amplified Classic. Ruth 1 16. And Ruth said, urge me not to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Wow. She had to make a choice, right? To, because that's what um, that's what uh, what do you call it Naomi said to the boss um, daughter-in-laws. So she made a choice. Sometimes being associated with with someone is not sometimes being associated with someone is actually start with choices, right? So now this choice, which is a good choice, transforms Ruth's identity and her life path, her pathway in life by aligning herself with Naomi. And the God of Israel, Ruth steps into a divine narrative. Let's confirm that with the verse, right? All right. Ruth 4, 9 to 10. Ruth 4, 9 to 10, Amplified Classic. And Boaz said to the elders and to all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilon's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Also Ruth, the Moabites, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to restore the name of the dead to his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his birthplace. You are witnesses this day. Now here's the thing. If we look at the story like we explained before, the two daughter-in-laws could have a state in, in the land that was that didn't have the, the God of Israel, right? Like in the land that didn't have that blessing because Bethlehem is actually the name itself. It means a blessing from God. Like it doesn't mean the blessing of God, but it's got the blessing of God, right? So here, because she's made that choice, the blessing came from her decision leading her to marriage to Boaz. Now, not only then is she married to someone that is godly, a relative of Naomi, which signifies her integration into Naomi's family and community, right? More. Now, that is a key word here. Because she chose to associate with, um, um, give me a second, uh, with Naomi, what happens is she integrated with Naomi's family and community. And her community and family are godly family, godly community. Now, Ruth becomes, because of that, she became, she had the, the great honor of becoming the great grandmother of King David, placing her in the lineage of Jesus Christ. How she chosen not to take that step that she took, right? Not to be associated with the mother-in-law and let go. She would not have that blessing. Now, this story beautifully illustrates that that Ruth's blessing and significant role in biblical history stem from her choice. I know I'm repeating that in different ways because it is very important to understand that our choice have a significant consequences over our life. From her choice to associate herself with Naomi and God's people. Amen. Amen. The second story, the story of Paul and the jailer. Now, Paul and Silas, we say Silas, Silas. Silas. Silas, right. Paul and Silas were in Silas. Silas, French. <laughs> Paul and Silas were imprisoned for preaching the gospel. Some of you may recall the story, right? While in prison, they prayed and sang hymns, leading to a miraculous earthquake that opened the prison doors. Now, the jailer, fearing the prisoners had escaped, was about to take his own life. But Paul reassured him that everyone was still there. Let's um, confirm that with the verse, right? Acts 16, 26 to 28. Acts 16, 26 to 28 in the Amplified Classic. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the very foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once all the doors were opened and everyone's shackles were unfastened. When the jailer, startled out of his sleep, saw that the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was at the point of killing himself because he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, do not harm yourself for we are all here. 
like, let me give you a little bit more in the context, right? Being the jailer, the one who was looking after all the prison, have, having thought, um, if those prisoners actually went out, he would be the one who would have to face the consequences of those actions and even be uh, um, responsible to the point of death, you know? But because this act of kindness by Paul and the miraculous event led the jailer to ask, so what must I do to be saved? Why did he ask? Because Paul decided to stay in there and then he, he, he understood. That is not a natural occurrence for the doors to be open. So Paul responded with the gospel and the jailer and his entire household believed and were baptized that night. By his association with Paul and Silas, Silas, Silas sorry, the, Silas. Silas, the jail received not only salvation, but also a new purpose and joy, highlighting how blessing can flow through relationships and sharing faith. So what does that mean, right? Because of his act, right? He decided to, like, he decided to say, I want to know what, how is he so different? I want to I want to have what he has. He's calm. The doors is open. He's even telling me out of his goodness, hey, you know, don't kill yourself. I'm still there. We're not going to move. I want to know who is that God. And that was an opportunity for Paul to say about, to talk to him about the gospel. What happened was a transformation, right? Let's confirm that with the verse. Acts 1634. Acts 1634, again from the Amplified Classic. Then he took them up into his house and set food before them. And he leaped much for joy and exalted with all his family that he believed in God, accepting and joyous, joyously, joyously welcoming what he had made known through Christ. Wow. Let me illustrate it. So this story illustrates how one association with faithful, remember what I said, with faithful individuals can lead to profound blessings and transformation in life. Like another word, like, you know, iron, sharpen iron, right? Number three, deception by association. Can that happen? Oh, yes. In this section, we will share two examples from both, again, the Old and the New Testaments to illustrate how our connections can shape our experiences, highlighting the incredible impact of our associations. A, the story of Achan. In the book of Joshua, the Israelites had just miraculously captured Jericho after a divine instructed campaign involving marching around and shouting in Joshua chapter 6, you know, march, the Jericho march, which we all, you know, so used, so are, um, so it's so commonly known. I just say that way. I'm tongue tied today. God commanded them to destroy everything in the city except for precious metals which were to be dedicated to the Lord treasury. Now A. Achan, an Israelite, chose to disobey this command. He took a portion of the devoted things that were meant to be destroyed and hid them in his tent. His decision not only brought personal um, gain to himself but ultimately this, this thing that he thought was a gain ultimately led to a significant transformation in Israel's fate. Let's, let's come from this bit with the, with the verse first, right? Joshua 7 verse 1. Joshua 7 verse 1. But the Israelites committed a trespass in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the things devoted for destruction... And the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. Oh, the anger of the Lord burned against just him? No, against Israel, right? So after Achan's sins, the Israelites faced defeat at Ai. Right? <laughs> this is just funny. I thought of something. At Ai, a smaller city found in Joshua chapter 7, verse 4 to 5. Now Joshua perplexed by this by this law sought God's guidance leading to the revelation of a sin in the camp found in Joshua chapter 7 verse 10 to 13 so they found out where the problem was coming the consequences of Achan's action were severe he along with his family 
Wow, he he is the one who hit it, but it was he. <laughs> <laughs> he along with his. I'm family. laughing because some cultures are still like that. <laughs> one person makes a mistake, they go after everybody, <laughs> the whole family. So he, <laughs> along with his family, faced judgment for the collective sin he introduced to the community. So because of him, every uh, everyone in his family had to pay, even though they didn't know and they weren't aware of it, right? Let's let's confirm that with the verse, right? Okay, Joshua 7, 24 to 26. Joshua 7, 24 to 26. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, son of Zerah, and the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent and all that he had and they brought them to the valley of Achor and Joshua said why have you brought trouble on us the Lord will trouble you this day and all Israel stoned him and those with him with stones and afterward burned their bodies with fire and they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day then the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor, or troubling to this day. Man, even the donkey had to pay for his sin. That tells you something. They were stoned and burned, illustrating how one individual's transgression can result in a widespread suffering and destruction for many. Now, this story highlights the theme that our choices can affect us, not, not only ourselves, but also the broader community serving as a warning against sins and disobedience. Let's look at the New Testament, how that one goes. The story of Ilmas, the, did I say it in French again? Elimas. Elimas and the sorcerer. Some things I say in French. Well, Paul and Barnabas, uh, yeah, Barnabas were on a missionary journey and encountered a proconsul named Sergius Paulus who desired to hear the word of God. Those names, I'll tell you. Elimas, the sorcerer and false prophet, opposes them, seeking to turn the pro, uh, proconsul away from the faith. Now, Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, directly confronted, confronted him. He calls him a son of the devil and an enemy of all righteousness, declaring that he will be temporarily blinded as a punishment for his deceit and attempts to, you know, throw off the truth. Let's confirm that with the, uh, with the word of God, right? Acts 13, verse 11. Acts 13, verse 11 in the Amplified Classic. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind, so blind that you will be unable to see the sun for a time. Instantly there fell upon him amidst a mist and a darkness, and he groped about seeking persons who would lead him by the hand. Mm. See, he is struck blind and is led away. Now, this even serves as a stock warning about the dangers of associating with falsehood and deceit. It also illustrates how those who align themselves with evil intention may face significant consequences which can lead to, to spiritual and even physical consequences. And All right, just before you get on to the next one. Yes. We are talking about the power of association. Now, I need to point something out here. Mm. It's just a little pause here, but a very important pause. Mm. The power of association, who you, you associate yourself with, whether it's in the church, whether it's in your workplace, whether it's in your family or relatives, it matters. Very it has much. a very big impact on your life. So you're saying even brothers and sisters in Christ, George? Yes. yes. Now listen to this, though. That is in, we're going to talk about that later on. It's in the However, preaching. if they are unrepentant, mm. if they're repentant, that's a different, different story. story. Because we are living in the new covenant. God on that cross, Jesus on that cross has done the finished work of the cross, has paid it all. So if they realize their mistake and they repent, genuinely repent from it, it's not going to affect them. It won't affect anyone around them. But if they're unrepented, as you just heard right now, all those people were unrepented. Yes, it will have an effect on even on your life. So you need to be very wise that if you're connected with a, 
uh, and I don't like saying this, but if you are connected with a church or a group of people who are unrepentant, who are a little bit off the path, who are a little bit weird or sect-like, and you've been praying for years now, or you've been praying for a long time and things haven't changed, they're unrepentant, then you need to be very wise and get yourself away very quickly. Find the right people. Find the right church. We will talk about that in... in uh, like it's very go. important you realize that because it will have an effect on you. It, that there is consequences. There's ramifications. It's like a domino effect, as you just heard. I thought that would be important for you to understand before we continue. Go on, baby. Well, we will get more into detail about that uh, as we go um, along the teaching. We will actually discuss those points on how to understand godly association, right? Right, number four, how to sustain godly association. The Bible inspires us to cultivate and cherish relationships that uplift us and resonate with God's purposes. Um, just to add that in there, I didn't actually wrote this one down, but recently just came came um, came to on my phone. Usually I get those kind of um, interaction with God, things happen. Well, you know, Miles Monroe said something. He said he did a study, right? A, an intense study about, on the Bible and he said, and he found out that uh, Jesus' time, 90% of his time was spent with his disciple and only 10% with non-Christian. That says something, isn't it? Let's continue. And, and even amongst the, the, the believers that he spent time, he also had three, yes. three that were most, that he associated the most. He spent well the most of, of the time. So discernment, of course, in everything we read, in everything we do, discernment is a priority. And discernment can only be, um, how do you call it, vetted through the word of God. Let's continue. So we were talking about how to sustain godly association. See, by transforming our minds and not conforming to worldly pressures, we can truly reflect his values, God's values in our life. Surrounding ourselves with the right people greatly influences our character and strengthens our faith. These teachings remind us of the importance of choosing associations that encourages us and aligns with God's loving intention. Let's get a verse to back that up, right? Romans 12 verse 2. Romans 12 verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. Amen. Now, one thing I'll add is one of probably one of the things that I didn't put in there is being whoever you associate. If you associate three quarter of the time with ungodly people and then and when I say ungodly, I'm not just saying oh, only on Christian is ungodly. Please read between the line. Right. But if you do most of your time with that and then you are still listening to the word of God, like they say, what you are, what you eat, what you listen is how your mindset function. So then that's when you're like one minute, you're all happy, you're getting revelation and you're going to like, whoa, here comes my breakthrough. The next minute you're like all depressed because you become double minded, right? Just, just a bonus to add on it. Let's keep going. So how do we sustain discern godly associates? A. Connect with those who journey with God. Right. That's right. So seek out individuals who prioritize their relationship with God, it's very important. You will you seeking out people who are like-minded in the things of God, right? Let's let's get a verse to back those up, right? Psalm one, verses one to three. Psalm one, verses one to three. Blessed, happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable is the man who walks and lives not in the counsel of the ungodly, following their advice, their plans, and purposes nor stands submissive and inactive in the path where sinners walk, mm. nor sits down to relax and rest where the scornful and the mockers gathered, gather. But his delight and desire are in the law of the Lord, 
and on his law, the precepts, the instructions, the teachings of God, he habitually med meditates, ponders and studies by day and by night. And he shall be like a tree planted and firmly. tended, tree firmly planted and tended by the streams of water, ready to bring forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not fade or wither, and everything he does shall prosper and come to maturity. Now, in this verse itself, we see there is um, there is a condition to it. It's not that God is putting a condition on you. If you do that, then this will happen. But it is a result of being abiding in Christ and his word that these things, this condition, then bring forth the blessing that comes with association, right? Or the curse if you don't listen, right? B, evaluate character. Another way that, you know, it helps you to choose who you can associate yourself with is by evaluating the character of the person or the group that you are in. The Bible cautions against forming associates with those who pro profess to be believers, like George was talking about before, yet participate in sinful actions like sexual immorality, greed, idolatry, abuse. I mean, that's just a little bit of some of those that are more obvious. Instead, Seek out individuals who exhibit godly character, right? It's very easy to, to think because, again, I said discernment comes into, into the play here, right? So you understand if it is just good word, right? The Bible says we get to recognize between what is of God. And George did a preaching about that, what is of God and what is not. What is the, uh, the righteous way, not just the right way. Uh, I hope you guys understand the difference. You want to read the verse for it, Beth? 1 Corinthians 5.11. 1 Corinthians 5.11. But now I write to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of Christian brother, if he is known to be guilty of immorality or greed, or is an idolater whose soul is devoted to any object that usurps the place of God, or is a person with a foul tongue, railing, abusing, reviling, slandering, or is a drunkard, or a swindler, or a robber? No, you must not so much as eat with such a person. Now, again, the disclaimer of this one is this, like George explained before. If the person is repentant, you don't keep looking at the person like they were like, like you know, last mm. time. You have to be able to see your brother and your sisters through discernment, through the eyes of, of, that, uh, of, of God, through the Holy Spirit, to know and not to discriminate against those who are truly repentant and trying to move forward from glory to glory with Christ, right? C, reflect on scripture. Now, that is a very big help. Regularly read and reflect on scripture to align your thoughts with wisdom, spiritual wisdom. Now, this will help you to discern or evaluate, if you want to say that way, potential associates according to biblical standards that the only way you will know that you're not getting uh, you're not getting yourself in a in a place where you're going to get backstabbed you know or you're going to be around people who constantly um do character assassination over your life and you and you're like i can't go forward well duh you should you should be listening how they are talking to you how they are treating you right let's uh, confirm that's with the verse right Joshua 1 verse 8, Joshua 1 verse 8 in the Amplified Classic. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe and do according to all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall deal wisely and have good success. That's right. You shall deal wisely with the people around you, so that you are able to walk with godly priorities with godly associates. D, prioritize godly relationship. Like I was explaining before, the Bible reminds us that it's perfectly fine to have friends from all backgrounds, while encouraging us though to focus on building relationships with those who share our faith and values. Let's confirm that with the verse. Philippians 4 verses eight to nine. Philippians 4 verses eight to nine. For the rest, brethren, Whatever is true, whatever is worthy of reverence and is honorable and seemly, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and lovable, whatever is kind and winsome and gracious, if there is any virtue and excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on and weigh 
and take account of these things. Fix your minds on them. Practice what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me and model your way of living on it. And the God of peace, of untroubled, undisturbed well-being will be with you. Again, what did Jesus do? Like George said, you know, he had some close people around him, right? He wasn't cl that close to everybody. He was selective. So selecting godly companions demands thoughtful reflection and earnest prayer. By following these biblical guidelines, you can connect with people who will uplift you, support you with your spiritual and even your physical journey. Now, keep in mind to assess, assess character, pursue wisdom, meditate on, um, you know, that's the whole, um, how do you call it, summary of it. So you keep in mind to assess character, pursue wisdom, meditate on scripture, stay clear of harmful influences, emphasize God connections, and rely on God's guidance in choosing friends who will foster your faith. All right, just before we finish, in our study today, we covered very specific topics in relation to the power of association. The first one that we covered was the importance of our association, covering uh, uh, the contrast between blessings by virtue and blessings by association. Second one, blessings by association. We went deeper into it uh, in uh, co by covering the story of Ruth and Naomi and then the story of Paul and the jailer. Then we went to number three, deception by association, where we covered the story of Achan and the story of Elimus the sorcerer. And number four, how to sustain godly association where we covered connect with those who journey with God, evaluate character, reflect on scripture, and prioritize godly relationships. So if you were not able to hear or see this study from the beginning of today's program, we encourage you to go back, listen to it, uh, and even share it with others, because you do not want to miss this. This is very important. Uh, it will be very, very beneficial to you. Right, let me finish with this quote by Gordon B. Hinckley. As you work with your associates to help them with their faith, you will save them and also yourself. Because as you bring them up, you're also going up with them. And you, you're, you're doing iron, sharp and iron. Amen? Amen. All right. If you're new here and you haven't heard the Word of God, you haven't heard the Christian faith spoken or taught like, like that before, well, it's not a coincidence. This is a divine appointment. You're here for a divine appointment for a specific purpose. And you know it. 1 John, 1 John 5, 4 to 5 tells us, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has, over uh, has overcome the world. Our faith. Where are you putting your faith? I always ask everyone this uh, uh, every week. Where are you putting your faith? You may be putting your faith in your job in money, in, in your habits or addictions or games or whatever, idols. The Word of God goes on to say, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Oh, there's another way, Jesus. Oh, there's this, there's Jesus. There's only one way, one truth, and one life, and Amen. that is through Jesus Christ. He's the only one. He's the only way that you can overcome the world. John 3, 16 to 17 is very clear and tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, talking about Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved and that might means will be saved if you put your choice if you make the choice of believing and and make jesus christ your lord and savior then you will be saved that's what it's saying there so 1 john 1 9 i want to show uh, uh, talk about that as well 1 john 1 9 says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, there you go again with that sin word. Yes, sin, 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 sin. I don't think we talk about sin enough in the church. I think we become very cowardly 
in the world that we're living in. Sin is very, very bad. Very Sin real. is what separated us uh, from God and is the reason that Jesus had to come down. He gave his life for us so that he, so we would not perish in our sin, but he took it upon himself in our place. So sin is very real, very wrong in the eyes of God. Nevertheless, when you put your faith in Christ Jesus, what he did on that cross covers all your sins, past, present and future. Where does that say? In the word of God. Okay, I'll bring it up for you so you can see it. Romans 10, 9 to 10, just amongst others, just one of many, says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So as you just, as you can hear me right now speaking to you, likewise, you cry out to God. It has to come from the heart. So you have to mean it. You cry out to God, to the Lord, to, uh, to Jesus Christ, and you make him your Lord and Savior. And then you'll be saved. But it doesn't stop there. Titus 3 verse 5, Ephesians 2 verse 8, Acts 1 verse 8, amongst many others, says, then you get saved by grace through faith, the gift of God washing away our sins and giving us the new joy of the indwelling Holy Spirit. What is that? And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. That is what we call in the Christian circles, baptism of the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit and fire. So after you give your life to Jesus, and you can do that even as you're listening to me right now, you just cry out to him from your heart. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Cry out to God and mean it as you heard in in Romans, as we just spoke, declare with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, we're going to be praying together so that we can have the baptism of Holy Spirit and fire. What that is, is he, you're inviting Holy Spirit, God himself, to come and reside in you, to dwell in you. You become his dwelling place, his temple, his synagogue, his church, whatever you want to call it. And he will live inside of you for the rest of your life. He will guide you. He'll protect you. He'll correct you. He'll comfort you. He'll love on you. He'll teach you. And he will even equip you. He comes bearing spiritual gifts, spiritual weapons, because we are in a war against the enemy. There is an enemy. Mm -hmm. But guess what? We, the war has already been won. So all he's doing is coming. He's dwelling in us. He's, he's transforming us in Christ likeness. And as we live life here along along the way, because this is still a fallen world at the moment. As we face battles along the way, Holy Spirit, with the weapons that he comes bearing, will teach us how to bear those weapons, how to use those weapons to go on conquering and conquering for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to pray with our brothers and sisters all throughout the world, Lord. I thank you that your word says that if we are hungry and thirsty, for righteousness, those that are hungry and thirsty for righteousness shall be filled. So right now we invite you with all our hearts, with every part of our being, Lord, and we say, come Holy Spirit, fill us afresh from head to toe, come with fire, set a fire in us, Lord, a revival fire that cannot be quenched. For your word says that our God is a consuming fire. Come Lord, we say fire in Jesus name, send fire. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. There's a party in heaven right now. If this is your first time giving your life to Jesus Christ, there's, heaven is re rejoicing over you right now. I encourage you. We encourage you. Please get connected with the Bible, Bible teaching, Bible. Holy Spirit sure. filled church. It's yes. very important that you are part of a Christian fellowship uh, in person, in person. If you can't, for whatever reason, whether you're in a country where you don't have those freedoms, then you can do it online. Mm -hmm. Find, however, brothers and sisters in faith that you can learn from each other because the church is also supposed to be a, a body, the body of Christ, where we help each other, edify each other, help in, each other, uh, serve encourage each other, everything. encourage and help each other grow through the journey yes. that we have here on earth. Amen. Amen.
All right, this brings us to our second part of the program called The Collective, where we spend time with those that are watching, those that are listening, and we pray, prophesy, whatever the Holy Spirit leads us to do. We encourage you to stick around. If you haven't already, as you can see right up there is all the social platforms we are in. Go and check it out. There's plenty of resources you can use for your cell groups in your church. If you are in need of help, even in your church, tell your pastor. You never know. Maybe you need some help in your church. That's what we are here for. We are an apostolic ministry to equip the body of Christ. We want to help the body of Christ. We're not here in competition. We're working together. Amen. Amen. All right. This brings us to the collective.